this is GPH uh, 492-692, and it's the uh, third lecture on seismic reflection and the uh, set of overheads and pictures uh, that we're using is uh, called uh, Seismic 2. So I'd like to uh, talk for uh, 52 uh, uh, slides about seismic acquisition, seismic reflection acquisition in particular. So seismic acquisition involves uh, putting out uh, active sources of, of seismic energy and then recording them with uh, sensors called geophones and linking those geophones back into some kind of recording system. Occasionally, uh, uh, and, and more and more often these days, uh, each sensor will have a recording system that is uh, uh, integrated into it, but the data still have to be broadcast um, to a, uh, a common archiving site. So we have here uh, one of our geophysics majors who is uh, uh, taking a look at the um, at a seismic acquisition uh, reflection acquisition program out in uh, Rye Patch between uh, Lovelock and Winnemucca, and uh, this was done uh, to take a look at a uh, geothermal field. I'll talk later about uh, the results from that we get from seismic reflection surveys in geothermal fields like this. Um, surveys uh, run like this one was by uh, my uh, uh, graduate uh, and UNR graduate uh, Satish Polymnopoliel and Optum uh, can be uh, very, very good So um, and, and get some pretty amazing results. So they start off uh, with uh, a gang of um, of these heavy vibrators. There's two that you can see in this picture here. And over here uh, you can see that the uh, the plate of one is pressed into the ground uh, and there are uh, reaction masses and, a, and hydraulic motors on it that uh, will basically uh, uh, shake up and down relative to the ground and put in the, the seismic energy then radiating into the ground. Um, and we uh, you know, one of them is not enough, so uh, we need two. Uh, and in fact, this survey had uh, more than two. All right, scrolling down to uh, another picture. Um, this vibrator is uh, uh, on in a park in the middle of the uh, uh, Truckee River in the in the middle of Reno. Uh, this is an urban survey, unlike. Uh, the Rye Patch one, which is uh, out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, this one uh, was all done on top of streets and sidewalks. Uh, you can see uh, some seismic cable that's been taped down, and uh, you can see that the plate from the vibrator is resting directly on the ground. So there's the plate, uh, and here is the, the reaction mass. So this one weighs 700 pounds, and it's being um, held against the ground. The plate and the reaction mass are being held against the ground by these hydraulic rams here uh, that are mounted on the back of this uh, large uh, uh, sort of medium-sized truck. Now uh, I'm going to play some some uh, animations which will show you just how uh, uh, how these uh, vibrators look when they're in action. Uh, you'll see uh, first uh, and here, a little bit of a much larger vibrator, like the one they used on the geothermal project. Uh, then you'll see the reaction mass of this one um, uh, in, in action uh, and see how it's, uh, uh, you know, at least you can see it moving at the lower uh, frequencies of the, uh, the sweep, as it's called. And um, then you'll see uh, how we here in the class, since we can't afford to uh, spend $50,000, $100,000 to mobilize these uh, vibrator machines from uh, uh, other parts of the country, from Texas particularly, uh, you know, how we have to put it in our seismic sources using sledgehammers. Okay, so uh, we're going to go off to that, uh, that uh, animation now.
clear. So now you've seen uh, a bit of the, uh, uh, you know, how we put in uh, these uh, uh, seismic sources with uh, 16, a 16 pound sledgehammer. Uh, I've got a few of them. Uh, we, we burn through them pretty fast. Um, one of the secrets to the seismic reflection technique is uh, lots of sources, lots of receivers, lots of source locations, lots of receiver locations. So seismic reflection is definitely a very labor-intensive, time-intensive uh, endeavor. Um, so here you see uh, the, uh, we're pounding on a plate, which uh, you can't quite see, uh, next to a line of geophones. All right. Hopefully we're not hitting the geophones. And here's our uh, Seismolab director, Graham Kent. And he's uh, pounding on a plate, uh, which you can see down here, uh, which is uh, uh, on the ground. This is uh, just south of Reno. Uh, so uh, you know it's helpful to be, uh, to be in shape uh, to do these seismic reflection surveys, in particular uh, uh, for swinging that 16-pound uh, sledge hundreds of times. Okay. You know, maybe uh, each one of you is going to have to swing it a uh, hundred times, um, and uh, you know, I'll 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 join you. I'll I'll probably swing it fifty times myself. Uh, to do that's to do one seismic survey, okay? Because we sw we swing it several times for every uh, every source location, and we have you know probably hundreds of source locations. We've got to carry a lot of heavy equipment around, um, so. Uh, uh, you know, it's the, the critical thing here is that you're strong enough that you can uh, carry the equipment without hurting your back, uh, and you learn how to do that properly uh, to minimize the risks to your uh, to your joints and your back, and that you learn how to uh, how to swing the hammer safely uh, so that you don't hurt yourself or anybody else. Okay, um, and um, I've had uh, plenty of small people in this class who. Uh, despite uh, uh, you know being uh, under five feet tall and and uh, and being slight, they uh, had trained themselves to have the strength to sling, to swing the sledgehammer uh, and do it safely and provide a good source. You know, even when I've had uh, you know big football players in my class, um, they can't necessarily um, uh, make a better source than. Uh, than somebody who's small but uh, uh, has sufficient strength and uh, can uh, swing that hammer precisely and, and safely. So uh, there's a bit of finesse to it. It's not it's not just brute strength. Um, you know, finesse uh, can get you a long way in this business. Okay, so um, obviously I need to uh, enlarge a bit. All right. Um, we've got uh, here, all right, if that stops flashing. Um, now, uh, uh, how are we going to record these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, the seismic signals that we put into the ground with uh, vibrators or sledgehammers? Well, we have our sensors called geophones. Okay? So here's a, a geophone, uh, which uh, we've talked about before. It's a... Uh, ground velocity, vertical ground velocity sensor. Uh, and so the, uh, the magnet um, uh, that uh, will move against the inertial coil is connected to the ground with this spike, okay, which you might be able to see. And uh, this one is a very simple system where the lead wire comes out and just delivers the millivolt uh, uh, impulses, the millivolt waves we get out uh, electrically you know, through this connector to this takeout, which is really just a connection point along a longer cable. So what we call the cable has at least 12 and sometimes as many as 96 takeouts. And each takeout is a different channel of recording results in a different seismogram on the recorder. Okay, And, the, uh, uh, and each, uh, each takeout can connect to, uh, you know, from uh, one geophone to uh, a large number of geophones that are linked together electrically. Now let me see if I can uh, back off on the on the zoom a bit. Yeah, here we go. All right. So here we've got um, an example of a uh, seismic cable, which you might be able to see here, uh, coming down toward us. 
and there's a takeout, um, and uh, you know the uh, uh, the takeout is uh, clipped into with this uh, lead wire of this geophone. The geophone is sitting uh, uh, as you know visually straight up. In fact, I think that one's probably been leveled, and um, so it's going to record the ground motion and deliver that uh, into one channel of the cable. And here is. Uh, uh, here's a setup uh, where we have more than one geophone in uh, uh, in the cable. All right. So uh, each takeout uh, right here, uh, you know, all this looping stuff here is the uh, is the cable as we call it, which connects together all the different channels. And here's one takeout, uh, and it connects to a lead wire. Which connects to one geophone, the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Okay, six geophones in uh, connected together. Uh, I believe these are uh, the sensors are electrically connected in, in parallel, and uh, so they all uh, sum the uh, ground motion into um, a, a larger current, larger voltage. You know, the more ground motion there is, it affects all of them, and then that um, uh, that gets delivered into one channel. Uh, of the seismograph via the cable. Okay, so uh, you know we we lay out flags that are uh, a certain distance apart. Here I think it's probably uh, two or three meters uh, for this survey, and um, we uh, uh, unroll the cable and put a takeout at every flag, um, and every flag is numbered uh, with the uh, the number that uh, of the uh, of the station. So each flag will. Uh, and each flag number will end up having a geographic location, and then uh, you can see the center of this uh, of this array of receivers here is uh, offset, uh, you know, by about a meter and a half uh, along the line direction, and uh, maybe a, a half a meter uh, transverse to the line direction is the center, kind of the center of mass of the geophone recorders. And you can see there's a little bit of overlap. You know, here's the last geophone in the six that uh, are behind the picture here. All right. Let's uh, zoom out a bit. Okay. Here's a um, uh, a more closely packed survey. Again, six geophones per uh, per channel, electrically summed. And you can see we got a real mess of cable here. Uh, that that cable, you know, that contains multiple channels has a lot of little tiny wires in it. So you want to avoid stepping on it. And uh, Mayo Thompson here is being very careful to avoid stepping on it. Um, by the way, uh, if you like what you're doing in this class, uh, I'll give you Mayo's email address, and you can write to him and see if he has any opportunities for summer internships. He works for uh, a geophysical company, uh, Zong. Uh, that has uh, uh, offices here in Sparks, and Mayo works for their office in uh, in Denver. So um, here we're installing uh, geophones in these little L-shaped arrays instead of linear arrays. Again, the point is to record the ground motion at a large number of places and put, you know, uh, uh, put our seismic source, our ground motion, into the um, into the uh, ground also at a lot of places. So every um, every one of these yellow flags, uh, which are only half a meter apart, is another uh, is another channel. So this survey, you know, takes uh, not very much space. Okay, and here we are uh, in the uh, uh, on a on a completely different experiment, um, and you probably can't see it, but on these screens of these this particular recorder is a uh, uh, are the seismic record that's being recorded. In this case, it was, uh, I think, at least 120 channels. So sometimes we can do our recording in a van like this. Uh, sometimes we're uh, just kind of stuck out uh, uh, in the middle of nowhere. And uh, so here's the, uh, the seismic recorder. You know, we got to keep notes of uh, what, where we are and, and what we're doing, where the geophones are, where the source was, and, and all of that. Uh, you know what time of day it was, and so here's the uh, recording unit. It's not so hard to haul around. It's hauling this uh, uh, this deep cycle marine battery around. Uh, that's that's you know it weighs uh, 50 pounds, 
That's what's not easy about seismic surveys, in addition to uh, using the sledgehammer. Um, you know, this full sun on this, uh, on this uh, 1996 vintage LCD screen. So we got to, you know, we use this blackout box to uh, just to be able to see the screen at all. Here's another example of the uh, seismic recorder in use. Uh, last year, in fact, at, uh, the, on the shores of Lake Tahoe. And uh, so we're just uh, sitting there out in the open. Um, and, uh, you know, as long as there aren't, uh, you know, snow pellets or, uh, or uh, raindrops uh, hitting the, uh, uh, the geophone, the tops of the geophones, we can actually do this, these surveys in, you know, whatever weather we can stand. Okay. Now let me uh, let me zoom in to the uh, uh, the rest of the slides here. So the the process here is uh, you know here here we're looking in cross section. We got some sort of reflector down here between I don't know alluvium and limestone. Okay, that's what they're representing. We set off a seismic source of energy. The one here is a uh, uh, a charge at the bottom of uh, of uh, maybe a uh, ten meter hole, okay. And that's going to um, send seismic energy down and straight back up. And each of these little inverted triangles is a geophone. So uh, you know we have geophones here and here and you know all the way across, okay. Um, so the reflection is uh, uh, you know it's, it we get one straight down and straight back up to the nearest geophone. You know that's a zero offset uh, uh, channel, zero offset recording. Uh, and then also we can send it back down at a, at a larger angle. You know, energy is coming out of the source at all angles, you know, whether it's explosion or, uh, 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 or uh, hammer hit or, or vibra size. Okay? Um, and it, it will bounce off, you know, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, bounce off this reflector and we'll get it at a geophone way out here. All right? So, um, that's a uh, very basic experiment, okay, um, and it's most efficient for us, at least, given our recording equipment, to set off one source. The source tends to be the thing that's expensive, okay, and uh, record it at a large number of geophones. All right, that's that's the most efficient way to do these surveys. Now, what do we get then in this in this record? Okay, this is a uh, you know with time going down and distance going across, you know, source receiver distance. Uh, in refraction, we call this a time-distance plot, and uh, we're looking more for more than just time now. Uh, it's the same thing. The, the refractions are up here. You know, here's the first arrivals, okay, up at the top at minimum time, and uh, we'll have uh, w waves. Uh, you know, these uh, slinkies here are, are representing the uh, the surface waves that are uh, the Rayleigh waves that are that are propagating uh, horizontally. You know, from the source and horizontally along the uh, uh, horizontally along the um, uh, the ground. Okay, the surface waves are typically going to going to going to prop propagate more slowly. So, from the perspective of uh, of reflection, okay, uh, not not from the perspective of of Remy, of course. Uh, you know, in Remy, we actually use these surface waves. But in reflection, they, they get in the way. They're noise, okay, um, and they're uh, they're low velocity, um, so they're a lot lower velocity than the uh, and they're steeper in this in the in the time distance plot, right? They appear more steeply sloping than the first arrivals and the refractions, okay, and the reflections, uh, you know, compared to them are pretty much going to be flat, all right. Uh, now they're actually you know they actually should be hyperbolic like I've described and. You know they should have NMO, but uh, you know not bad to think that they're you know pretty much going to be flat. That's a that's not a bad first assumption when you're just looking for them. All right, here's one of these uh, wave tests. Now um, you know you can see the, uh, the there's actual seismograms in here now. Although all you can see is where the seismograms are positive, it's black. Where they're negative, it's white. Okay, where it's near zero, it's white. Um, and so, uh, you know, how do we tell what wave is what? Well, the first thing we do is measure uh, some velocities, okay? And so this air wave, um, you know, has a velocity, and, and notice this, this is, you know, prime per second, right? So that's feet per second. Velocity is 1170 feet per second. That's right about, um, 
um, that, that's that's right about uh, 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 330 meters per second. Okay, and uh, so that tells us it's an air wave. Okay, not only because it's straight, but because of the velocity itself. The um, the first arrival, because it's first arrival, uh, we see that's uh, uh, you know that's that's the refraction. The 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 first arrival is by de definition a refraction. Could be a direct wave, but you know usually by the time we see it, it's a refraction. All right, and um, then there's these other straight waves, right? That are other things. You know, these are uh, various modes of Rayleigh wave or other uh, other surface waves, S waves, and all that. Not uncommon at all. And uh, here's a uh, up here is a uh, reflection. Can you see? It's a little bit. It's got a little bit of normal move out, right? It's getting flatter up here. We can't see it so well through the uh, the Rayleigh waves and the air wave, but it's flatter up here, and it's asymptotic to the first arrival. So there's a reflection, and there's probably other reflections that are almost parallel to it down further, but you know they're obscured by the by the noise. But uh, you know these are the factors that allow us to identify uh, you know what's what's in uh, what's in our records. You know what is each wave? Well, got to look at the velocity. You got to look at whether it's first arrival. Uh, you also look at its relative frequency, uh, and it's you know you want to find reflections right for reflection survey. So uh, then you look for that hyperbolic NMO, you know, flat at the top. Here's another example of a reflection record. Okay, so how do we know this is a refraction? Well, it's the first arrival. Okay, uh, how do we know these are Rayleigh waves down here? Because they're very slow. Okay, they they're they're steep. Uh, maybe one of these is actually an air wave, but uh, uh, you know we'd have to take a look at uh, exactly where uh, uh, exactly where the uh, where the uh, uh, you know, we have to have a horizontal scale to be able to calculate the velocity. We got the time scale, but not the horizontal scale. And then reflections are the ones that are almost flat, but then they have you know you can see some significant normal move out here. They're becoming hyperbolic to the refraction. All right, so there's some good reflections in there, kind of in the middle of the record, a little bit obscured by the Rayleigh waves. Okay. Now, to successfully uh, make a recording like this, you know, where we can actually tell what's going on, we can measure velocity without, without too much uncertainty, right? I mean, we gotta, you know, to get rid of these Rayleigh waves, um, you know, we really need, we we need, to, even though we don't want them, if we want to try to filter them out, we gotta record them well. Okay, so how about that? So, we have to take some pains, uh, very often, to record the part of the data we don't want, because because unless we record it well. We're not going to be able to remove it. It's just going to be a you know one of these. Uh, it, it's it's going to be noise that's less looks less coherent and is harder to handle. So we got to we got to pay some attention to how well we record these waves in space as well as time. Okay, so uh, notice that um, uh, you know go back to this uh, wave test here. All right, if I come down one sizing ramp, which is one vertical stripe, okay. You know, I go positives, which are dark, and negatives, which are which are light. And you know, on this plot, we're not seeing the intermediate amplitudes, but that's okay. Uh, you know, but they're there. Okay, they're they're in the data. So positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. You know, it's a it's a wave. It's swinging back and forth. Okay, and there's you know there's a, a wavelength there. The the in time. Okay, as I'm going down the record, right? I'm I'm going down. I'm going to larger and larger times. Which you know uh, presumably would be connected to reflections that are coming from deeper and deeper depths. That's why we plot time increasing down. Uh, but notice that I can also go across, okay, from left to right, and I see this. I can see the same thing. You know, uh, you know, it's uh, okay up here. You know, positive, negative, positive, negative. As I as I work my way across, I, I'm I'm also seeing a. Um, uh, a wave. So the waves are, are, you know, they're wavy in space in time, as we'd expect. They're also wavy in space, and and in a, with a record like this, where we've got lots and lots of recordings, okay, um, we have, uh, you know, we have just as good a recording in space as we do in time. Okay. Well, how do we know we have just as good a recording in space as we do in time? All right. 
Now on the bottom of this, you know, this is another cow weight and wood uh, diagram. Okay, so notice here, uh, you know, it's time t is the uh, axis to the right. Okay, so now we're plotting time to the right, and you know, here's the wave amplitude. Right, it goes up and down. Po you know, positive, negative. Right, that's fine. Uh, and and we can take you know the peak to peak time. That's uh, this is the Greek letter uh, tau. It's a small tau actually, and um, uh, that tau is the uh, is the period, and the temporal frequency that you're used to. You know, uh, the frequency in hertz, right, per second, uh, or rotations per second, or cycles per second, is uh, is the inverse of that temporal period. Okay. Um, the temporal frequency. Well, in space, you know, now x is going to the right, just like it did up above, right? X is going to the right. Um, we have the same thing. Okay, there's you know positive, negative, positive, negative, and there's a uh, a wavelength here, which now you know we call it lambda a length because it is a length. It's along the x-axis, right? Um, and uh, you know, here's some cosine uh, e equations for cosines that could define these waves. So just like we have a, um, um, just like we have a temporal uh, uh, period, we have a um, we have a spatial wavelength, right? Lambda, Greek letter lambda, and one over lambda is a spatial frequency, which often I call k. All right. So uh, f k, right? That's temporal and, spa and spatial frequency. Um, all right, so just some uh, terms there. Now, how do we record these waves well? And and what's what we're trying to do is we're sampling waves in time. All right, and with our modern seismographs, it's, we can sample those waves in time. You know, every um, you know every ten or even uh, or, or fifty microseconds if we want to. Okay. Our uh, even our old you know 1996 vintage uh, Bison recorder can uh, sample those waves at 50 uh, microseconds. Okay, way less than a millisecond. Um, and for most of the work we're doing, you know, um, uh, a tenth of a millisecond, you know, 100 microseconds is is way more than we need. All right. So our our uh, if we take our, our time sampling interval, you know, which we set when we when we program the seismograph, right? That's a delta t, and I said that might be 50 microseconds, right? Okay, well, if I'm recording at 50 microseconds, all right, uh, then um, uh, then uh, you know what's what temporal frequencies uh, am I able to represent? Okay. Well, there's going to be a top limit on the temporal frequency, and I, I, I think I've talked a lot about this a little bit before. That's called the Nyquist frequency. That's the top frequency that we can uh, uh, that that this delta t, you know, recording at this delta t will represent. So if I'm uh, if I'm recording at um, uh, 50 uh, microseconds, right? That's um, what is it? A twentieth of a uh, of a millisecond, so it's um, my sample frequency um, is uh, uh, twenty thousand uh, hertz. Okay, but I got to divide that by two. Okay, so the top, you know, even with that fifty microsecond uh, recording, the top frequency that'll be represented in my in my digitized data. Okay, at that delta t is ten thousand hertz, ten kilohertz. You know, which in terms of you know, if you're if you're recording music, say, you know, that's pretty lousy. That's uh, you know, hardly cell phone quality um, uh, voice uh, uh, digitizing. But for seismics, you know, uh, we're often looking for maybe uh, it's been it's been really hard to go try to try to uh, record uh, you know, uh, get more than 500 hertz um, frequency for real. Okay, and so. Um, you know, at 500 hertz, right? Uh, if I put in 500 hertz here for the Nyquist frequency, then uh, multiply by two, and that's a thousand hertz. That means that I can sample at one millisecond intervals, and do just fine. Okay. Um, so easy with a seismograph. We can we can you know we can almost have any Nyquist frequency we want, right? We just have to 
you know, dial down our delta t to accommodate to higher frequency. All right, spatial frequency is much more difficult uh, uh, to uh, to have uh, high spatial frequencies because spatial aliasing is much more difficult to avoid. Why is that? Okay. Um, all right, our spatial Nyquist frequency, K Nyquist, okay, right here, is one over two delta x. Okay, so um, uh, uh, the the problem there is that uh, you know how do you uh, all right? So you can get up to a higher spatial frequency if you have if you have um, smaller delta x, right? Um, well, if we go down to one um, one meter, or, or as we had here, uh, half a meter, uh, for that uh, really tight survey that I that I showed you the picture of with with Mayo Thompson, then uh, you know our highest spatial frequency is one per meter, right? I mean, temporal frequency is is per second, right? Hertz, and there isn't a special name for uh, spatial frequency per meter, okay? So that means uh, you know cycles per meter. So our minimum wavelength is one meter, um, and that's when we're sampling. You know, we got to sample these twice per wavelength, and that's twice per horizontal wavelength. So anything that uh, uh, that is uh, you know at a higher frequency than one per meter, one cycle per meter, um, you know, we 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 couldn't get it. It would be spatially aliased, but. You know, half a meter uh, spacing between geophones is is that's as small as we can go really with the kind of equipment that we have. Um, it's really tough to uh, to to imagine sampling less than that. Um, but uh, it may not be uh, may not be enough. Uh, and and you know even if we had the equipment, right? If you want to sample twice as often, but uh, you know, you want to record out to the same distances, right? Because you want to see those first arrivals out to uh, uh, large enough distances to see uh, uh, to see those refractions, uh, giving you velocity information down to uh, uh, your target depth, maybe. Um, and you, uh, if you keep cutting delta x, that means you got to keep increasing the number of channels. And for every channel on the ground, right, you've got to put a geophone into the ground, and you got to have a cable to connect it to and a takeout. So uh, you know, it's no problem to reduce delta t. It's a huge problem. It costs money to uh, to reduce delta x, okay, and try to get rid of spatial uh, spatial aliasing. So um, okay, uh, you know, let's let's uh, solve this equation uh, for um, um, uh, and include an, an additional factor. Okay, um, so we have to see, we have to use a delta x, an interval between our geophones, a distance between our geophones, that's less than or equal to this equation here. All right, and uh, this is now uh, trying to factor in the the um, trying to factor in the uh, the geometry of our recording. Okay, so if we're recording out to great distances, all right, let me go uh, back up here. All right. If we're recording to great distances, okay, then uh, all right. If we're recording, uh, you know, just uh, you know, straight down, and the reflections that come straight back up, right? The emergence angle of those reflections is going to be zero, zero degrees from the vertical. Okay. So uh, the emergence angles uh, that I'll call theta is zero. But if we need these longer offsets, okay. We're trying to get some NMO information, right? So we need, uh, you know, we need to see that that opening up of the uh, of the triangle, okay? Then um, we need that larger emergence angle, and uh, and that emergence angle, you know, here it's like sixty degrees, right? Sixty degrees from vertical, okay? All right, that's where we run run into trouble, and uh, and here it is, okay. Um, All right. So uh, now, if we have an emergence angle of of zero, right? We're only interested in recording, you know, straight down and straight up. That's what uh, you know, like the chirp device does. 
all right? The emergence angle is 0. The sine of 0 is 0. That means we're dividing by 0. Basically, delta x is infinite. What, is that? what, is, what the heck does that mean? Okay? That means that, that we, could, we could just use one geophone, you know, and there could be an infinite distance to the second one. All right, so one geophone gets us, you know, for uh, uh, for what's called normal reflection, you know, reflections going straight down, bouncing off a, a, a flat reflector and coming straight back up. Um, you know, we don't need to worry about uh, how many geophones or how far of sp space they are. All right, what about that sixty degrees? Okay, let's say I wanted to get uh, represent a, uh, I wanted to represent a. Um, um, uh, frequency of uh, 100 hertz, you know, fairly high. You know, maybe I need that kind of resolution, right? Uh, and I've got, you know, typical um, 2,000 meter per second velocity in alluvium around here. All right. So the sine of 60 degrees is, uh, let's see, that's um, uh, that's about uh, two thirds, you know, 0.6. So we got 2,000 divided by 2, that's 1,000, uh, divided by um, uh, our, our maximum frequency is, uh, is 100 hertz. So 1,000 divided by 100, we got uh, 10 left. Okay, And then we, uh, uh, we divide by, uh, by 60 degrees, or yeah, divide by the sine of 60 degrees. So that's about 3 halves. Um, and um, um, and so, uh, you know, the larger the angle, uh, you know, the, the smaller, uh, the, the more that's, the larger that sign will be. It's on the denominator, so it's going to, it's going to make our, uh, um, it's going to make our, uh, um, uh, our delta x uh, 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 smaller, okay? So at 60 degrees, right, at 100 hertz, uh, with 2,000 meters per second, you know, we're looking at uh, maybe uh, 15 meters, all right, that we have to put our um, our geophones apart, okay? Uh, but, ah, you know, that's um, <clears throat> that's for a, uh, uh, a reflection. You know, what if, what if our, um, um, what if we're looking at a, a at a Rayleigh wave, okay, is traveling at only, you know, uh, 200 meters a second. Okay, so let's do it. Let's do it again. Okay, we've got um, um, and and you know in in the lab data uh, that we're working on for refraction, you can see Rayleigh waves. Uh, uh, we'll work on it again for uh, uh, for Remy in our Remy lab, uh, and those Rayleigh waves have uh, velocities of about 200 meters per second, and uh, you know, maybe uh, we're still trying to look at 100 hertz, right? So 200 meters per second divided by two, we got 100 left. Uh, divide by 100, uh, we got one left. Divide by the sine of 60 degrees, right? And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's getting pretty bad. It's uh, you know a meter and a half, right, for delta x. Um, and if we're trying to record over a whole basin that's uh, you know say five kilometers wide, that's uh, that's pretty bad. We'd have to put down uh, five thousand channels, you know, at least uh, three thousand channels to record that, um, and that's uh, maybe more than we than we think we can afford. Okay, although becoming more and more common. Um, just a little more discussion of apparent velocity variations due to immersion angle, right? Um, you know, the uh, the apparent velocity that we see depends. You know, it's the real velocity of the propagation of the wave. Divided by the sine of its immersion angle. Okay, so that's uh, uh, the apparent velocity. So uh, at the at an immersion angle of zero, we have an apparent velocity of that's infinite, right? It it hits all the wave front, you know, coming up here, hits all these receivers at the same time, you know, infinite velocity. All right, and you know, so one receiver is just as good as the other for recording this this wave that's coming straight up at at the array. Okay. You go to 45 degrees. Okay, you get a a a, a lower but still pretty high um, uh, immersion ang uh, uh, apparent velocity. Okay, and then at 90 degrees, right, you get your minimum apparent velocity. The apparent velocity is equal to the tr the uh, ver the uh, the vol the rock velocity, right? So the uh, uh, the more horizontal the wave propagation, 
the more it's the lower its velocity will be, and uh, you know its apparent velocity won't be any more than the true velocity. Now remember, sine is uh, the sine of any angle is is one or less. So you know the apparent velocity is you know its absolute minimum is the true rock velocity v, right? And it can go up from there. It can be it can be infinite. So uh, you know you can uh, you know very easily draw in this uh, image source right here's a flat uh, reflector right and so using that mirror you can extend it back and you can get the immersion angles okay just that way and you know the farther the offset okay I almost forgot about the point I wanted to make here the farther the offset the uh, um, the the greater the immersion angle and the closer we'll have to put the the geophones right to uh, to avoid spatial aliasing, right? You know, here near the shot, we don't, you know, to record this this reflection at the near zero immersion angle. You know, we could have very sparse geophones, but out here, you know, at further distances, we got to have uh, very close geophones. And there's where a lot of the costs of a uh, uh, a seismic reflection survey come. So. Uh, let me give you a list of the procedures you need to follow to uh, acquire a seismic reflection survey. Okay, um, and I'll make some comments uh, about uh, what um, uh, what we'll do this year. Um, so uh, step one is permitting. Okay, you've got to decide where your line's going to go, and uh, of course who's going to pay for it, and uh, you know what its purpose is, and uh, then you can lay out. Uh, uh, its path, and you'll you'll know an the answers to questions about like uh, what kinds of sources are you using, uh, what kinds of receivers, uh, are you going to be having to bury your your receivers or drill in your sources, um, and uh, then you got to go and ask the uh, landowners for permission. Okay, and uh, there's really hardly anywhere where we don't have to ask permission anymore. Um, we are going to do uh, this uh, this year's surveying on Indian land uh, in the uh, Walker River Indian Reservation, I believe, um, out of Shures, and uh, we want to make sure we have uh, things arranged so that uh, you know they know we're going to be there and uh, they know they're satisfied uh, with what we're doing and and uh, everybody will be happy. Okay, so uh, you know permitting, especially uh, if you're um, you know, permitting a, a survey for uh, oil and gas extraction um, across private land, right? You're going to have to pay the landowners uh, for access. They expect that, um, and so uh, it's part of the budget. Um, then there's uh, uh, there's surveying, okay? And for us, uh, you know, that involves uh, laying out, uh, uh, you know, 100 or 200. Um, uh, locations for the uh, for each channel, okay. Each flag, we'll call it. Uh, each uh, each source and receiver location, okay. We might call them VPs for vibrator points. Um, we might just call them flags, and we uh, we number them. And usually, uh, we want to follow a path, and and we want to to put um, all those uh, source and receiver locations. Uh, at that uh, constant uh, delta x spacing that we determine we need, um, and so uh, typically I uh, have two people chain that out with a tape measure. So we'll find out how to do that in the field. Uh, then you have to, if you're using uh, drilled uh, uh, shot holes, you got to do the drilling, and uh, uh, usually uh, most shooters will will uh, uh, also uh, load the holes with explosive. Uh, uh, if it's a remote enough area, they'll load the holes at the same time. That way, they can fire them off quickly uh, in sequence. Okay, when they're when they're actually recording. Uh, you know, step three could be mobilizing the vibrators or uh, uh, you know getting the vibrators to the field area. Okay, um, and then uh, number four is uh, labor intensive, and you can't record any data until you've got it done. Uh, for us, you know, we're going to have to lay out uh, two 24-channel seismic cables, and we're going to have to put in, um, install a total of um, uh, a total of uh, uh, 
uh, six times forty-eight uh, geophones. Okay, uh, so it takes a couple hours, uh, even with uh, ten people. All right, and then uh, we record, and uh, for us, uh, uh, that's also pretty labor-intensive because we record, uh, you know, ten shots uh, usually per uh, uh, per flag. Okay, per source point uh, at each uh, flag. And so uh, the recording is probably, you know, for uh, a 100 or 200 meter long uh, reflection line, it's going to take uh, all day. All right. And will involve, uh, you know, maybe a thousand uh, hammer hits. Right. So not one, you know, one person can't do all that. Uh, it takes a while. And then hopefully uh, we have time to pick everything up and remove all the cable uh, at the end of the day because, um, you know, the uh, little desert rats. Uh, Pack rats and and uh, uh, or kangaroo rats down in the, in southern Nevada, you know they uh, they just love to chew on those uh, those cables. If there's cattle in the area, yeah, they'll they'll try to eat the cables, the geophones, everything. Uh, make a real mess of your equipment. So you got to pick it up before nightfall. A lot of places we have we can only get permits if we if we promise to uh, uh, to have everything picked up before. Uh, uh, before the end of the day, uh, leave no equipment uh, out there. <clears throat> All right, so um, just some uh, examples of uh, of layouts. This is a uh, off end spread or single end spread. You know, spread is the is is really the configuration of the cable versus the uh, the source. And uh, uh, in most seismic surveys, you actually keep this. Uh, this is you know kind of a two D concept here, obviously, which is the kind of survey that we're going to do. Uh, in most surveys, you you keep this relative geometry the same, and you march the source and all the receivers, you know, uh, down uh, along the line. Okay, so uh, you uh, collect data from one shot point, you know, maybe ten hits or uh, maybe uh, four uh, vibrator sweeps, and uh, and then you move the whole thing up. Um, uh, you know, you pick up the uh, the back channel of uh, of geophones. And uh, you put those out ahead, and they connect into the cable that uh, is is continuing down the landscape. And you move the uh, the shots ahead, uh, the the vibrators ahead, or you move the uh, the plate for the the hammer hits uh, up by uh, uh, you know up by one interval. Okay, uh, here is a, um, a photo of a uh, a single end. Uh, um, a single end spread. Um, so he's uh, uh, hitting the plate. There's the plate, right? It's uh, going uh, with a sledgehammer. All right, there's the plate, and um, here are you know this very tight uh, cluster of uh, it's probably 24 channels at least um, that have been laid out uh, you know off the end uh, of the of the shot. Okay. Um, but uh, uh, we can also uh, do what's called a split spread, all right? Um, and that's where we uh, we put our uh, shot point in the middle of the uh, uh, of an existing line of geophones, and we can march along this way too. Uh, this is good, uh, you know, if we have uh, a variety of dips, um, you know, for reflection purposes too. I like to shoot up dip, and if there are dips in both directions, then uh, often uh, you need some kind of split spread. Okay, and let's get this uh, uh, this picture visible. And so here we are uh, um, splitting the spread uh, at uh, Lake Tahoe last uh, last summer. You can see there's uh, geophones uh, uh, behind um, Russell Carr and in front of Russell Carr, um, and uh, he's uh, hitting a plate that's uh, just a few centimeters from the geophones, but uh, you know, he did a good job along with the others uh, and did not hit any geophones with a sledgehammer. Okay. So, um, uh, you know, those are efficient ways, uh, you know, uh, off end spread uh, and, and um, it's called a roll along spread, is, is when you, uh, um, oops, you know, when you actually. Uh, Um, 
Okay. So it's called a roll along spread when you. Um, let's see. Yeah. When you when you make this uh, this relative geometry, if I can get it, okay, and you uh, you take it across the landscape, okay. So uh, you know we keep a uh, a constant uh, distance between the uh, the source and the closest geophones. And the farthest you have phones, but then you you know keep rolling this thing along the the whole line you want, okay. So um, um, that's the that's the efficient way you know with these roll along spreads. Uh, and that's the efficient way to record the data, uh, but it's not the most efficient way to look at the data and analyze it. All right, um, you know so that's uh, we collect the data with uh, one source into many receivers. But what we want to do is is end up with um, all the uh, sources and receivers that are centered around each midpoint. Okay, in each midpoint, you know we've got uh, you know we've got sources that are close to the midpoint, and and we record the receiver that's equally close to the midpoint. So the the midpoint is just the average location; it's right in between the source and the receiver. Okay, and uh, but we want a range of angles at that midpoint, a range of offsets at that midpoint. Okay. So really, what we'd like to do is is end up with uh, a whole um, a whole uh, variety of uh, uh, of offsets, but you know, with traces that are all uh, addressing the same midpoint. Okay, and then we should see. Okay, we should be able to make the geometric correction and uh, you know take these uh, you know these these further offset uh, uh, receivers, right? Source receiver pairs. You know they're, the reflection is going to appear later, right? Because it's longer, and we'll we'll you know take out that, and that's according to the normal move out, right? The NMO. We'll take out that NMO, the extra NMO time. We'll correct the times back to T zero, and we'll see our traces all lined up like this. Okay, so there's noise and then a, a little reflection, and if we if we just add them all up, you know we add up the amplitudes, right? The positives cancel out the negatives. And we can increase the uh, the size of our uh, the you know the signal to noise ratio. We can increase that you know after we add it all together. This is the process called stacking, right? We make the NMO correction, okay? We line up our traces like this, and and the reflections should line up, and and then the stack accomplishes the uh, the compositing, okay? Now uh, the more you know here we're stacking four traces together, okay? And what we get there is uh, the the improvement in signal to noise is proportional, you know, not to the number of traces we stack together, but to the square root of the number of traces we stack together. That's just a, a fact about uh, uh, about white noise and waves. Okay, so uh, if we have n equal to four, then uh, you know we have we have doubled our signal to noise ratio because the square root of four is two. Uh, you know, you get into a process of diminishing returns, right? Uh, uh, if you want, um, if you want ten times the signal to noise ratio nominally, you've got to uh, you've got to have a hundred times the traces. Uh, and and you know, we we might collect uh, uh, well, not not here in the class, but pretty common to collect data that's you know got one or two hundred traces, and so it'll have uh, you know at least hundred points per midpoint. And uh, and so you can get that ten times uh, increase, you know, and we have forty eight traces, right? And if uh, if we weren't doing too well, and we needed to, you know, double our, um, um, if we needed to double our uh, our signal to noise ratio, uh, then uh, we would need four times forty eight traces. So what is that? Three eighty six or something, or three eighty four. So uh, you know, we need a lot more channels to get double the. Uh, uh, the signal to noise ratio, and so, you know, we only get two times the signal to noise ratio, but it costs four times as much at least to do the survey, right? That's uh, kind of diminishing returns, right? So there have to be other reasons to have more channels than uh, uh, than just this uh, signal to noise ratio. Okay, so um, uh, now how do we convert our um, 
how do we convert our our uh, um, our roll long records into uh, into the common midpoint, common depth point record, right? So this is a, a cross section showing you, you know, how we address a single a single depth point, a, a single midpoint, with a uh, with a record that is, you know, spaced around that. All the traces are spaced around that midpoint, right? That would be called a CDP, a common depth point record, okay? And uh, and often the term used is just CDP. They don't say it's a record or anything. It's a CDP. All right. We get to kind of resort the data, okay? And you do that using this thing here, which is called a stacking chart, okay? So um, you make a, a graph basically, which has the flag number of uh, where each channel was, and then the uh, uh, and you arrange it uh, according to the flag number uh, on the other axis. That's the flag number where the source was. Okay, so uh, you know this this uh, line up here. It just shows twelve channels to keep it simple, right? And the source is at, at thirty one. Okay, so it's at line thirty one, and the receivers go from flags thirty eight to twenty four. Okay, down here at the bottom, and let me let me lift that up slightly. Down here at the bottom. Uh, the source is at, at flag 45. Okay, so it's down here on, you know, at the uh, at the bottom of the scale, and the receivers were at uh, 52 flags 52 through um, 38. Okay, so um, uh, and and let's come into this one here in the in the middle. Okay, uh, this the and and so you can see that we as we roll the survey along, right. Uh, source at 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, and so forth. You know, we're advancing. Uh, we're keeping that stable roll long relationship between the uh, uh, the source and the receivers. You know, the receivers move up one whenever the source moves up one, and and then we have um, uh, you know the whole roll long survey here. So how do we pick out the the uh, the common midpoint? Okay. All right. So. Uh, uh, source is at 38 there, okay, and this receiver is at uh, is at uh, 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 39. All right, so the the midpoint is halfway between them. That's well, that's halfway between 38 and 39, okay. Uh, and and notice I'm I'm reaching up to you know this was recorded when the source is at 30. I'm sorry, <coughs> source is at uh, the midpoint's at 38. Okay, so let's look for midpoints at 38. All right, so here, uh, here the um, the receivers at 39, the source is at 37, right, and halfway between it's 38. Okay, let's look down at this one here. The source is at 39, and and here the receiver is at 37. The midpoint's at 38. Let's look at this one down here. The uh, the source is at 41. The receiver was at 35, right, and uh, and the midpoint is 38. Okay, so we draw a line which is actually perpendicular. You know, it's kind of perpendicular to uh, uh, to the line of sources. We draw a line, and the six geophones that are that are within that line that fall on that line, those have exactly the midpoint of 38. Okay. And and so now you know this line is at midpoint 38. This line is at midpoint 37, right? Is we follow this? That's got the uh, the six traces, uh, the six geophones that have the midpoint uh, uh, at 38. Okay, using both the source and the receiver coordinates, you know, along that that two dimensional line. Now there there's uh, there's three more, right? And like uh, this one here has source at 36 and receiver at 39. That's uh, um, that's 37 and a half, right? Um, and so we might decide, well, you know, we can we can uh, um, you know, if we only want six traces per midpoint, uh, we say, all right, we're gonna we're gonna make a midpoint bin that is uh, you know less than uh, less than half a flag interval. Okay, and only those six traces will fall into there. If we make a midpoint bin that is a full flag interval, right? We would we could include into it then uh, these here that are at thirty-eight, 
and these six here that are at thirty nine that are at uh, thirty seven and a half, right? So we get twelve total, right? And a whole uh, you know one hundred forty percent to more, uh, you know, twice as many traces, we get one hundred forty percent more um, uh, signal to noise ratio, right? When we stack together those twelve traces instead of just six, so often uh, we do that. Uh, we we bin these together, okay, and um, and we make our, our midpoint bin interval the same as our as our receiver interval, okay. And you'll see that done uh, when we when we work on our own data set in lab in the in the reflection lab, right. And then uh, you know the next twelve down they belong to the next midpoint bin, you know which is a whole uh, a whole flag interval down. Now that number of uh, of uh, traces that you include in your midpoint bin, that's called the fold, okay. Now here's another thing, right? If we're looking at a very low midpoint number, like uh, you know 32, um, you know this might be uh, th let's see 31, 30, uh, 30, 20, yeah 28, okay, uh, is uh, going to be one of these, right? And and that's the only trace that's at midpoint 28. All right, so so you know. Let's say this was the entire survey, right? There were just uh, uh, you know fifteen sources done, right? Fifteen source points done, and twelve uh, you know there's twelve channels. So for you know below, um, let's see, you know if I'm adding up traces, right? Below midpoint thirty four, okay, we get fewer and fewer traces, right? You can see it's wedging out, fewer and fewer traces. Finally, just one trace, and then. You know, below uh, 28, there's there's no traces at all, so zero fold, and we uh, on some of these uh, uh, you know low midpoints we have uh, we have lower fold than uh, than 12, and then up here at 33 we get to 12, and the fold of 12 continues until here, and you can see it wedges out again. You know, we stopped the survey at shot point 45, we didn't go any further, and so it wedges out, and and uh, you know that's going to be at um, uh, the average of 52 and 45. That's going to be like at uh, 30, uh, 50, 47 and a half, okay. And that uh, or 48 and a half, and that uh, you know that's going to be the highest numbered midpoint for which we have uh, we have any data at all, you know. So the the fold uh, uh, reaches a maximum, and in this case, it's uh, you know formally at six at the exact midpoint. We can expand it to 12. But it's constant, you know, when we're in the middle of the survey, and then it dies out at the edges, tapers off at the edges. And you know, the uh, lower the fold, the the lower the signal to noise ratio, you know, via that uh, that square root relationship. Okay. And we're doing that stacking because we're always fighting this. Uh, you know, the reflections are weaker the deeper we get, right? We go down to deeper depths and. You know, let's say we have 200 foot thick beds, and you know, there's five of them up down to a thousand feet, and down to 10,000 feet, there's 50. You know, and so um, you know, only so much energy gets down there, right? A little, you know, five percent reflects at at every one, right? And uh, you know, so if we have alternating beds, then uh, the uh, the the energy that 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 we have for uh, the amplitude of our reflections is going to drop just because of that. Right, just you know, the deeper beds, uh, not much energy is getting down to them. Okay. Um, there's also the effect of Q. You know, the further, the higher the frequency we try to use, and the uh, uh, and the further the wave propagates. Okay, and the lower the Q, the more energy we're going to lose. Okay, so you know, um, if we have a uh, hundred, we're trying to record hundred hertz uh, energy. And um, uh, and we have a Q of ten, like we do in alluvium. I mean, we're going to be thirty decibels down. Okay, that's a lot. That's a long way. Um, that's like a factor of of ten down in in amplitude. Uh, and this is you know for a particular uh, velocity. That's fairly typical of say oil field work. Um, so you know. We are, we are fighting uh, not just noise but all these other effects. Okay, they're distorting the, the seismic wavelet. They're uh, 
you know they're making it weaker and they're uh, they're changing the uh, they're changing the frequency content. Okay, so we begin with a nice sharp seismic wavelet that hits our our plate. You know, sledgehammer hitting the plate. You know, very nice sharp seismic wavelet. You know, it could be broadband. Okay, spherical divergence takes away amplitude. All right, uh, it takes away all all frequencies equally. At least that. All right. Partition of energy takes away amplitude. Takes away a lot more amplitude at higher frequencies. Uh, interference between reflections. You know, will take away, uh, especially at thin beds. Takes away amplitude, especially at higher frequency. All right. Uh, scattering. Okay. Takes away amplitude, especially at higher frequency and higher longer distances, as as with uh, absorption. Okay. So our reflected wavelet is going to be smaller, and it's going to be it's it's going to be lower amplitude. It's going to be lower frequency, okay, because of all these effects, all these propagation effects, okay, uh, and and here's a list of some of them. You know, some of them affect uh, bandwidth. Some of them affect amplitude. Some of them affect the phase. Okay, spherical diversion divergence only affects the amplitude. Uh, partition of energy. You know, it can negate the phase. It can uh, uh, it can uh, change the uh, lower the amplitude. Reflection interference can change everything, you know, make it a lot, give it a lot, the, the reflections a lot less bandwidth. Scattering can change everything, uh, including phase. Yes, the answer to that is, is not questionable. Uh, absorption, um, you know, Q uh, changes, uh, change, you know, uh, it's the alteration of uh, seismic wave energy into heat energy, right, changes everything. So, uh, you know, what we're trying to do is, is record you know, somewhere in this uh, sweet spot where we're above the, uh, uh, you know, we're below the maximum signal that we can put into the uh, the preamps, okay, and every recorder has pre pre preamplifiers, okay, and but we want to stay above the noise, okay, because the noise environment will, uh, uh, you know, will will uh, remove, you know, we won't be able to see anything much below the noise, in, in as far as reflections. So you know, one last note on uh, on on making good recordings, okay, uh, has to do with with uh, the selection and the installation of geophones. All right, if we want to reduce uh, low frequency signal, if we want to reduce ground roll, which is you know really just Rayleigh waves, okay, if we want to enhance the high frequency data for higher resolution, we want to select a geophone that has a higher natural frequency. You know, it's got a stiffer spring. Okay, the little leaf spring that holds up the moving coil, that's got to be stiffer, and that'll be a higher frequency geophone. Okay, and and it won't be as sensitive to those low frequencies, so it won't you know over be overdriven, you know, by the uh, the low frequency but very strong Rayleigh waves. Okay, so we actually have uh, uh, a selection of geophones. We have four and a half hertz geophones that we use for Remy, because we want very low frequencies for Remy. We have uh, eight hertz geophones that we use for seismic refraction, okay, and we also have um, 100 hertz geophones uh, in groups of six per channel that uh, we use for high res reflection, okay. So uh, and the hundred, you know, you can feel how loose the springs are in the four and a half hertz geophones, and and you can't feel the spring at all. You can't feel the mass moving at all in the hundred hertz geophones. You know, if we want to, you know, say we're doing Remy, we want to enhance the low frequency signals. Then we can select a, a low natural frequency, and, and that's why we have the four and a half hertz geophones for Remy. Uh, but aside from the uh, aside from the uh, um, the geophones uh, natural frequency, there's also the geophones uh, coil resistance. Okay, and and that has the the utility of um, uh, of uh, you know, making the geophone uh, sensitive or not. Okay, so uh, if you want to increase sensitivity, okay, then you you choose a large coil resistance, right? You'll get uh, um, you know more amplitude out of um, uh, of the same ground motion, but that's also going to you know pick up a lot of noise, right? So if you uh, uh, if you want to decrease the noise you pick up, you choose a low coil resistance and. You know they they've pretty much settled on a, on standard coil resistances for each uh, her, uh, each uh, natural frequency of geophone, 
And there's also a uh, damping factor that uh, there's a little shunt resistor in there, uh, you know, that goes across the coil, that uh, you know helps you bleed uh, voltage out, and that that makes sure that uh, uh, that acts as, a, as damping. Okay, it you know the, if you just had the spring and the and the coil, then it would wobble up and down forever. Okay, if there was no um, if if there was infinite resistance between the the two ends of the coil. Um, you know, there'd be no energy transmitted and, and no damping. So uh, that would mean, you know, with zero damping, H equals zero, which you, you may or may not be able to see here. Let me, uh, uh, let me enlarge it a bit. Okay. With H equal to zero, um, you know, you're basically going to get a, these are spectra here. So we have frequency on a log scale and we have uh, response, you know, relative uh, uh, output of the geophone. Uh, increasing uh, in a, on a log scale up, right? So you know you get a hundred times the response, a thousand times the response at the natural frequency, than you do at, at any other frequency if you um, uh, if you have no damping. So we always damp. Um, here is uh, 0 0.7. You know, 0 0.5 has a little bit of a hump at the natural frequency. We'd like to make it as flat as possible, so. We follow this 0.7 curve. We, you know, that's 70% of uh, critical damping. Okay, at one times critical damping, there's a little bit too much roll off. All right, it's, it's too damped. All right, so we uh, uh, we like the spectrum to have this nice corner there that we can understand, and it's it's pretty much at the natural frequency of the geophone. So it's you know it all it all makes sense. Okay, so I'm going to show you some. Uh, some geophone installations. All right, here's a uh, uh, along Pope Beach in Lake Tahoe. You can see that uh, there's a line of geophones installed every uh, it's either eight or ten meters. There's the geophone with its uh, the top of its head just sit sitting up uh, above the sand, and the its uh, lead wire and it's plugged into the uh, the takeout on the cable. You go eight meters down the cable. And there's another geophone set. There, there's its lead wire. Geophone's down here in this hole in the snow. And the next one, the next one, you know, and so you go on down. And um, if I can scroll, uh, here's a, a more closely spaced reflection survey. Okay, we've got six geophones lined up, uh, plugged into the ground at the bottom of, the, of this snow trench that we had to dig to do our survey last time. Uh, last year, and the uh, the main cable is uh, is up here on uh, uh, on top, and so the lead wires uh, actually the main cable is being uh, uh, is hung down to uh, plug into the geophones. Quite a mess, you can see. You know, on average, we're we're you know we got the six geophones in line, uh, but uh, yeah, pretty messy. Uh, I was amazed we were able to get the data that we were that we did out of this. Here's an example of a, of a bad geophone plant, right? It's snowing at the time. Uh, the geophone's plugged in there, right? If, if there's too much water there, um, or mud especially, you know, with some electrolytes in it, then that can cause a short across the uh, geophone terminals. That's why we have swamp connectors, too, if we're going to be working in very muddy areas. Um, but, you know, um, we didn't have those on this cable. And here the geophone is planted kind of in the snow, OK? Uh, not not too good, all right. But that's the best we could do that day. Uh, here's a geophone that is spiked into the turf, all right. Uh, just sitting there in the turf. Uh, the uh, cable sitting there. It's uh, you know the the brass connectors are are not sitting in the mud, so or water, so that's okay. Um, but you know the spike is in the turf, but you know that geophone doesn't have as good a connection as it as it should. You know, especially for size and reflection work. This is actually uh, a Remy survey where these plants work. These poor plants work. I showed you the examples of poor plants uh, uh, there uh, in my in my Remy lecture. But um, um, you know, this uh, uh, this would not be a good geophone plant for uh, uh, for size and reflection. Here's a somewhat better geophone plant for seismic reflection. You know, you can see that we spiked it. We cleared the snow away, spiked it into the mineral dirt, 
we've got the cable held out of the snow. Okay, so so there's no chance of shorting the uh, shorting the circuit between those two um, uh, connectors on the cable. Uh, you might notice that the black one is a thin connector and the red one is a fat one. Uh, you'd think you couldn't plug it in wrong, but uh, but you can plug it in wrong, and it's been done. So uh, you know, uh, gotta watch out for that. Uh, pay attention to what you're doing. Right there's the uh, um, right. You can see the uh, uh, the thin clip there and the uh, the fat clip there. Okay. So just a couple of, uh, of guides about uh, um, about geophone plants. All right, uh, the best plant is with a longer spike, and you scrape the surface. You scrape all the loose soil off the surface. Uh, you know we have three or four inch spikes, so we can make a good plant. Uh, you still scrape the surface. If you brush the uh, you know the pine needles and the leaves off the surface, and you spike it into the top of the surface, but you don't you don't scrape it well. That's not quite as good. It's still fair for seismic reflection work, and if you spike it through the turf or through the pine needles, it's not going to work for for reflection. Okay, if you just put it, you know, and you got it, you know, we got six times forty-eight geophones to plant. You may be tempted to uh, to spike them through the uh, through the pine needles. It doesn't work. Okay, um, and and one one reason it doesn't work is show you know you can see in this. Uh, in the spectra here, um, what we're looking for is uh, you know the geophone natural frequencies uh, about here, all right, and and we got a steep roll off below that. That's just the nature of the 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 uh, uh, the velocity geophone. How it, you know the moving coil against the magnet, uh, and the magnet is the part that spiked into the ground. The moving coil is is inertial. Um, you know they roll off very fast below the uh, uh, below the the uh, resonant frequency of the geophone, but with a good plant, they're flat. Their response in in you know is flat up to uh, you know several times the uh, natural frequency, and that's what we that's what we want to end up with. Okay, uh, so that's the best plant. You know the good plant, it's it's going to have a peak you know somewhere in the higher frequencies and and that. Uh, that's not always good. Uh, that that can cause uh, you know cause uh, certain noise to to get emphasized. And then you know we go to the fair plant. Well, and this this peak is coming down, and it's you know we're starting to see that we're not getting some of the higher frequencies that we want. You know with that best plant. And then uh, you know no service preparation. Uh, not only is there can there be a lot of distortion. Um, you know, it's going to emphasize uh, some low frequency that's uh, right above the uh, the resonant frequency, and that's really not good. Okay, so here's some some guidelines on on how to make that best plant. You know, if you've got the time, if you got the labor, uh, you use your uh, your rock hammer to to dig a, a six inch hole. Okay, um, you uh, take the uh, the pick end of the rock hammer and you spike a hole for the geophone, and you plant the the geophone spike into there. Okay, and um, um, and then you uh, you fill in the 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 you plug in the uh, uh, yeah you, when you when you put the geophone down, you got to remember to not forget to uh, to plug the geophone into the cable. All right, so then you plug the geophone into the cable, and then you bury it. Okay, and it's best if you can bury the geophone, you know, six inches deep, with um, with sand or or uh, maybe small gravel. If it's you know like cobbles and rocks, uh, it's not going to work so well. You know, there's not not much point in burying it then, um, because they'll uh, kind of clink around and rock around. Uh, against the geophone case, and so that's all you'll see. You won't see any actual reflections, or first arrivals, or anything. Okay. So this is, uh, uh, you know, for reflection work, this is best. It's tough uh, when we, you know, when you have 48 times uh, times uh, uh, six geophones, we end up usually not burying them. We uh, we use scrape surfaces. You know, we scrape off the 
the grass and and dead and dead grass and sticks and all that, and uh, we spike them in. But usually, I'll try to press them in, you know, with the heel of my boot so that they're, you know, all you can see is the very top sticking out of the sand. Okay, so. Um, uh, now, actually, uh, you know, with this advice here, um, you know, it can't be raining on the geophone. But in the desert here, we've had better luck when when the ground is wet with reflection than uh, uh, you know. Usually, we're we're very you know, our ground out here is very dry, and when it's very dry, um, then uh, uh, then we have we have a, a lot of trouble getting decent uh, seismic reflection data. Um, okay, so you've got a lot of noise. Um, you know, we uh, uh, we can put in. Uh, you know, we can start using the six uh, geophones per uh, per channel per group, as they're called geophone groups. Uh, we can increase the fold. Okay, uh, you know, certainly by widening our uh, our midpoint bins, or or we can use uh, more channels per shot. Okay, that's those are all ways of increasing the fold. Yeah, that's why we have 48 channels for our work. Um, if we have uh, instrument noise, is not too much of a problem these days. You know, recorder noise, but ground roll is a real problem. And uh, you know, we'll experiment with uh, some low cut filtering. You know, after data recording, not before data recording, uh, to get rid of that. Sometimes we can do spatial filtering with source and receiver arrays, and that's really the reason why we have the six geophones per channel. Uh, and we'll demonstrate that in the in the field. Okay, so here's uh, the the objectives uh, or the uh, the information you need to design the uh, the survey, and then go get it permitted. Um, you need to know you know what is the travel time to the to your your objective. Okay, how deep is it? What's the velocity like to likely to be? And so, what's the two way travel time? How much time are you gonna have to record? And uh, that's gonna tell you a lot about. Uh, uh, you know how um, uh, how big a source you're going to need. Okay, uh, you know below 100 meters, we're not going to have much luck in, in at least in, in this area uh, of seeing it with uh, 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 below 100 meters uh, uh, with uh, with a sledgehammer. Okay, we need bigger sources like those vibrators. Uh, the maximum dip of our horizons. You know, the greater the dip, then the um, uh, the larger the distances, uh, sources here are distances you want to use, okay, and uh, and that's a very important consideration. The uh, desired uh, bandpass, right? How you know what kind of resolution do we need? All right, uh, you know, do we need to really go to those highest frequencies? Uh, and that's going to say a lot about how hard our survey is going to be. You know, how far out? What's our minimum offset for? Getting any kind of velocity control using our NMO analysis, you know, where, how far out do we have to get to see those, uh, uh, to see those uh, uh, asymptotic tails of uh, of the neural move out? Okay, uh, what's the noise environment like? Are, if we're working in the urban environment, you know, we're just going to need more sources, more receivers. Uh, we gotta, we gotta, you know, redouble our effort. Okay, uh, also. Um, uh, very important to know, you know, what is the uh, in terms of source generated noise. You know, those are the Rayleigh waves, the air waves. You know, what are their highest and lowest velocities? Because we got to make sure that we don't spatially alias those. Okay, and we also want to record reflections where they'll have distinctly different apparent velocities than our source generated noise, our, our Rayleigh waves and our air waves. So these are uh, it, it. It for this reason, it may even be worth doing a Remy experiment. You know, a little Remy recording before you uh, right in your field area before you uh, um, before you do your uh, um, uh, your your you set up your seismic recording, your, your reflection recording, because uh, you know you can you can get your highest and lowest uh, Rayleigh wave and air wave velocities, um, and and your uh, Rayleigh wave frequencies, your air wave frequencies. You can get all that from a Remy uh, uh, analysis. So uh, you know, it could be a uh, you know pre-survey with Remy could be uh, quite useful. All right, so uh, you know, there's all these parameters we got to determine. Um, 
you know, the depth of interest uh, goes into the far trace offset, the near trace offset, uh, but the depth of interest does not contribute to our determination of the group interval, okay? Uh, you know, that would be the uh, delta x. Uh, the required resolution and the steepest, you know, that determines the frequency and the steepest dip. Uh, that, that determines the, uh, 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 you know, what our delta x has got to be, okay? Um, you know, the charge size is, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, or other source effort required, right? Uh, the deeper it is, the larger the source we need, okay? The resolution is going to say something about that. Noise problems say something about that. So this, this guide here is, uh, you know, where you have these dots, that's kind of, you know, what feeds into what. And this list of things on the left-hand side, those are all things you have to decide when you, deci when you define your survey. And, and so, okay, the reflection group, uh, these are things that I want you to uh, uh, get some sense of what do you need and what can you do, right? I mean, we can't, uh, uh, we can't get 96-fold data with our equipment, okay? Uh, we can only get 48-fold data, all right, at, at the most. So, um, you know, uh, the multiplicity can only be so much uh, given the equipment we have. So... Uh, you know, given the equipment we have and given the nature of our objective, okay, imaging um, the, uh, the faulting at, uh, you know, say 30 meters depth at, uh, um, uh, at, uh, 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 in the Walker River Basin near Walker Lake, um, that's, uh, you know, I, I want you to start thinking about, you know, what, how should we design our survey, right? Uh, you know, we've got certain limitations on our line length. Uh, our reflection equipment, uh, you know, we could collapse it to a line length of only uh, 24 meters, or we could expand it out to 150 meters, okay, so uh, with our 48 channels. So, so that's, uh, uh, that, that's all, uh, uh, you know, all things that, that need to be considered and figured out for every separate project and every separate objective. All right, so... Um, uh, after this has been the uh, seismic acquisition uh, lecture, and uh, we'll have a uh, 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 the next lecture will be the fourth lecture on seismic reflection, which is going to be about uh, seismic processing. Okay, you know what do we do with all this data after we record it? You know all these records after we record them. How do we sort them? How do we filter them? How do we stack them? And that that's what I'll cover next time.